Okay, well, it looks like it's that time again. Let me make sure it looks like we have audio. Looks like it. Hopefully everybody's hearing me. Um, why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, today, uh, I'm going to try and hit on a couple of topics here. Uh, and in case you didn't spot uh, the message that I post on the forum, I just mentioned uh, that some of the materials we're going to be using uh, using today, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think some of these might go into next week or certainly into our, our lab session. Uh, so part of what I'm going to be working with today, and actually I started on some of these uh, during our last session here, are some examples that I posted here on the course website. Uh, so we've actually already touched on the Stanton Gem Cabine 2 and the Stanton Gem Cabine Trunk Emax 2 example before. Today we're going to be looking at the last two examples. These are actually uh, zip files that you download and, and open up into your uh, into your MI260 directory. They are uh, you know they are example files structured much the same as as the other examples that we distributed in the initial initial components. So if you haven't already gotten these, please go ahead and download these and uh, install them on your flash drive, assuming that's the way you're running this. Uh, I've also made a few changes to the course handout and, and consequently the slides. Uh, so those are reflected in the revised handout that's available here uh, on the course website. And uh, if time permits, and I think it will, thought I'd spend a little time going over a recent example that uh, uh, that we'd worked on here in the shop and uh, that uh, I thought would be useful to illustrate some some principles and the application of some uh, model-based meta-analysis. So uh, I guess without going any further, let's go ahead and uh, get started on today's topics. Okay, so let's open this up. There we go. So what I wanted to start out today on is talking about extending uh, the kinds of models we've already done so far a little bit further. And in particular, I wanted to talk about incorporating uh, an additional type of sample statistic that's often reported uh, in the in the data that you that one might collect from various sources of aggregate data. And, and so up to now, we've only talked about looking at sample means for continuous outcomes. Well, with continuous outcomes, typically you'll also get some report of some measure of variability or uncertainty in those measurements. So typically you will either get uh, a standard deviation uh, for the individual values or a standard error for the mean. Uh, and those are, and you can always calculate one of those from the other, at least in the typical case where we're looking at sample means as your primary measurement. So we're going to talk in particular about looking at uh, how we might make use of the observed sample standard deviations that are often reported uh, along with our mean data. So the idea is not just to model the standard deviations all by themselves, but as something we might use to augment uh, the modeling of the mean data. And let's start out by maybe just touching base on why we might want to do that. Uh, so my first comment here is that if the intended application of your model is adequately supported by prediction and comparison of population mean outcomes uh, for different treatments, uh, then the analysis of just the sample mean data is typically going to be sufficient to address that particular issue. Uh, so if you're basically trying to maybe compare the mean response to a new compound relative to comparators that are already in the marketplace, just looking at the mean data is probably adequate uh, to, to address that kind of an application. Uh, but there's, you know, is a comment here, but even then that, you know, incorporating the analysis of the observed sample standard deviations might provide some marginal benefit. Uh, in those cases. It's usually not going to make market differences in your key inferences, but you get a little benefit by accounting for things like intertrial differences and variability. And when you do that, you 
then you would be more appropriately weighting the different studies relative to each other because the method we've talked about right now only uses sample size for that weighting. Of course, we all know that uh, the variability within trials uh, will sometimes vary from trial to trial for, for various reasons. So if we bring in modeling of these sample standard deviations, that's one way we can deal with that. Of course, I, we already talked about another one where we actually just directly incorporate the standard errors in our likelihood for the sample mean is, an, is another strategy for doing that. Uh, but then in my second comment, I just mentioned that, you know, on the other hand, there's some applications uh, such as using clinical trial simulations uh, to support trial design. Uh, things like that uh, can benefit significantly from better estimates of variability and the degree to which that variability may vary from trial to trial. Uh, because if you don't incorporate it and you try to use your model for trial simulations, there's a chance you may be uh, you may be neglecting the fact that there may be substantial variability across trials in their variability, uh, and not and if you don't take that into account, you may end up making somewhat over optimistic uh, estimates of trial success. So as I say here, in those cases, it's worth the additional effort to model the sample standard deviations along with the means, particularly if as part of it, you model the heterogeneity in those standard deviations. So let's talk a little bit about the how. Yeah, so how would we incorporate that into our model? Uh, so as a comment here, if your underlying individual data is normally distributed with some mean mu and a standard deviation sigma, then it turns out that the distribution of this quantity here, oops, right here, this n minus 1 times the sample variance divided by the true variance, that that quantity would be chi squared with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Uh, so again, S here represents your the sample standard deviation. N is the sample size in that equation. And equivalently that, you can say then that S squared, which is really the unknown quantity. I sh actually, I shouldn't even call it the unknown quantity. Sorry, it's the it's sort of the uh, the experimental measurement in this whole thing. That thing is gamma distributed. Uh, and, with these parameters here. So the often these parameters will get called alpha and beta, for example. And the alpha here is n minus 1 over 2. And the uh, beta here is n minus 1 over 2 times the variance. So you've got now a model where uh, the n, of course, is something you know. And really, the only parameter in this on the right-hand side that you would be estimating would be the sigma squared. Uh, with in here. So that's what we're going to use to describe the likelihood function for our sample variance, our S squared. So what have I got here? So let's, uh, so what I'm going to do is we'll jump right from this to illustrating how to use it. In the first example that I'll show you, we'll just use this as is. We'll actually assume that the sample variance term here, this sigma, is the same for all of the trials to illustrate the use of this likelihood function there. But then we'll take it another step further and incorporate intertrial variability uh, in that in that sigma term uh, as part of this to illustrate how we can incorporate a sample variance as part of this. Now, uh, another comment to make as we think about this, one of the reasons why you would do this, do something like that to deal with the heterogeneity in, in, in the variability across the trials would be uh, well, as compared to the other approach we talked about, which was using the observed standard errors, uh, is, as I pointed out before, when you use the observed standard errors to do that, it means you have to have such a standard error, or if it's missing, you have to impute it by some means. And, you know, and I suppose, you know, you could use a fairly trivial imputation strategy by somehow averaging across the various trials. 
Uh, but what we can do if we model it, it actually provides us with a more rigorous approach to actually modeling that variance and using that model to impute uh, the sample variance term in here. So, so in particular, you don't have to do things like throw out data just because you don't have a standard area standard error, nor do you have to use sort of a crude imputation strategy. You can use something more rigorous. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples of doing this. So the two examples I'm going to take a look at here is one is in that one of the folders. I Well, these are both ones that I've distributed in the in the course website to be added to your collection. Uh, one's called Staten Gemka Bean SD Trunk Emacs, and the other one is the same name but with a two stuck on the end of it. Difference again being the first one just assumes the same residual standard deviation for all the trials, whereas the next one incorporates some random intratrial variation in that residual variability. I think, yeah, let's we'll jump right to that. So let's go ahead and pull out that first example. And so where do we go? Here we go. Uh, we got Staten Gemka Bean SD Trunk Emacs. My names are getting too long there. Uh, let's go ahead and open up both the model and the uh, R script to go with it. Okay, we don't need that. Okay, let's get the model okay so let's take a look at the model now this is base this is taking uh the model that we did before that was just called statin gem cabine trunk max which we've already seen and I took that and just modified it to incorporate the modeling of our observed uh, sample standard deviation. And actually, the way we're going to write it is akin to the way it's in he in the slide. In fact, let me pull that slide back up. We're going to do it like this, where we're actually going to model it in terms of the sample variance term. So we're going to take whatever reported standard deviation and square it if we need to, or if we have it reported as a standard error, we'd have to first multiply that standard error by the square root of n and then and then square it to get a sample variance. And that's what we're going to use as our dependent variable. So what you, when you look at uh, the example file here for our model, what you'll see is it's essentially identical. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing because most of it is the same as what you saw last week. Uh, the key differences are going to be things like right here. Uh, you can see where I've got a term labeled ver PCLDL. So that just represents the sample variance for the percent change in LDL. Uh, and that is something that is going to get passed into the bugs code as data. So again, this is a likelihood, and the left-hand side is generally going to be data, though occasionally that data is going to be missing. Uh, but more on that in a minute. Uh, so that's going to be data. That's going to be described. Uh, the likelihood is described in terms of a gamma distribution, uh, as you see here, with... Uh, you've got some parameter here that I've just called a ver i and another one I just called b ver i. So those are the two parameters from for our gamma. And again, pull the slides over. So and so a ver then represents this n minus one over two, and b ver this n minus one of two times sigma squared. And you notice it's got the index i on there to correspond to the different treatment arms because of course those treatment arms are gonna differ with respect to the sample size. So I have to go ahead and calculate those. So that's what's going on right down here. 
Uh, so you can see the air var is just that n minus 1 over 2. So it's n sub i because it's for the i treatment arm. And then the b var is going to be, well, it, instead of looking, instead of being n minus 1 over 2 times sigma squared, we've got it in terms of the precision here. So precision is nothing more than 1 over sigma squared. So it's equivalent then to that n minus 1 over 2 times sigma squared. So that takes care of calculating that. Uh, I mean, somewhere in here, we have to provide the information about this precision term. And that's I done identically as it was done in the previous example. If we go down and look at the uh, prior distribution, I just used the same one that we did in that in the previous example where we did not incorporate uh, the sample variance into the model. So that doesn't change nor does go back up here nor does the way we deal with our percent change in ldl for our mean percent change in ldl that's handled exactly as we did it before so you've got this uh, left hand side is our sample mean right hand side we have our model based prediction with some precision about that uh, and so the precision for rmi is calculated right here and again that's done just like we did it before we have this uh quantity our, our sigma our one over sigma squared term which if you like again you can think of that as sort of being a hypothetical residual precision for a single individual multiplied by the uh, by the sample size for that treatment arm so again the only real differences are bringing in uh, the line for the variance and calculating uh, the parameters that correspond to that. And that's pretty much all we need to do in the model to bring it in. If we take a look, now that then implies there's certain things we have to do to, uh, as far as the data management to make it work. Uh, and in particular, we have to provide the, the sample variance values as part of the data set. Uh, we're also going to have, let's see, is there anything else actually? Let's see, we need that. Um, I think that's about it because we actually don't have any additional parameters because the only estimated parameter in this pair of quantities that get passed in there is really just the PCLDL precision, which was part of the previous model anyway. So that doesn't change. Uh, so let's take a look. At the R script. So again, almost everything here is going to be the same uh, as it was before. The main difference being, uh, where do we go? Yeah, right here. Right here. Now recall that the way the data set was set up, uh, there was a column in there for the standard error in the LDL percent change from baseline that was called, you know, this SELDL PCFB. Uh, so that's been, that was passed from the data set. Uh, so we want to convert this to a sample variance. So we, uh, so what I did is square uh, the standard error so that we really get the, the, the variance in the Basically, we get the variance in the mean, and then I multiply that by the uh, by the sample size in order to get this in terms of the sample variance. And I believe that is the only change in this whole mess. You know, other than, well, I'll take that back. The other changes in the script is I do things like make sure that we actually capture that in here, I believe. Actually, no, I don't even need to change that because we didn't actually add any parameters. So the only real thing I changed is down here where I captured the predicted values for our um, for our sample variance in here. And I guess I didn't point that out in the model. If we go back to the model and go down to the pred section here, I have a term here for calculating a predicted value. In this case, I don't have a separate predicted and uh, conditional value here because there's no inter uh, there's no inter trial random variation on the variance in this particular model. So so as a result, there are there's not a separate population and individual prediction. They're identical 
in this case, so I only have to do it once. Okay, so that's the setup. Uh, we could go ahead and run it. Uh, I think I'm just going to go ahead and jump to the uh, Julia Child approach here and use the, the result of the run that I already did, which I've got in here already. Uh, and we can we can take a look at the results on that. Uh, so what can we say about it here? Maybe I can go ahead and pull that up here. I actually didn't really look at a comparison of that to uh, to what it is when you don't incorporate the standard deviation. We could actually do that real quick. That would be, let's see, that would correspond to, make sure I get the right one. Excuse me while I scroll around here to get it. Uh, let's see, I believe that was this guy here. Ah. I guess I need to go up into the solution section. Okay, let's make these things big enough to see. I don't think there's going to be anything very earth shattering to look at. Uh, as we look at these, so the left hand side here is the uh, the model where we only use the sample means. The right-hand side is the model where we use both sample means and the standard, well, and the sample variances. Um, one of the things you'll notice is the, you'll see that the things like the mean deviance, which is minus two times the log of the likelihood, uh, those are very different, but keep in mind they're not really, you can't compare them because we have fundamentally different likelihoods now, because in one case, you only had a likelihood in ter likelihoods in terms of the mean. Now we've also incorporated likelihoods uh, for the sample variance. So they're not, you can't use those for comparing models uh, in this case. Uh, but if we go through, it might be, I actually haven't gone through to sort of compare uh, what it means in terms of the actual uh, results in here. Uh, the E0 mean actually isn't much different. It looks proportionally different, but keep in mind that it's basically close to zero. Uh, if you look at the uh, confidence bounds here, there's, they're not a whole lot different. Uh, Emax statin's about the same, N statin. So I think if we go down through here, we're going to find that the bulk of these are very close which is consistent with the notion I was talking about before, that you, you don't expect to see see this have a big influence, particularly in the way I've done it here, where I have not even allowed for the possibility of any intertrial variation in the, um, in, in the residual uh, variance here. So under those circumstances, I wouldn't expect to see much of a difference here. Uh, there might be for some of the variance parameters, you might, you might enhance the precision a bit. So I haven't really looked at the sample standard deviations. You might see something there. Uh, if I had to expect that, I don't know, maybe if we looked at things like the, uh, where do we go? The, where's my omegas in here? Oh, there it is. I guess that's right. We only had one random effect, didn't we? Uh, actually, it didn't reduce that to any substantial. Oh, I was looking looking at the wrong thing. I should be looking at the precision. That's about the same. It didn't make much difference. The sigma, um, no, nah, it didn't make much difference there, did it? Sigma. Oh, okay. That one it did, okay, because we have a uh, that's the one place where it made a difference. If you look on the sigma here, we've got a uh, posterior standard deviation of around one, and you can see it's, a, it's actually knocked it down quite a bit. So I guess that's the main place that we've enhanced this is estimation of that particular quantity. But having said that, that's not something you're likely to be using for uh, for inferences here if you're just comparing uh, things like sample means for treatment arms. Okay, so that's doing, that's sort of the simple case. I guess before I go to incorporating intertrial variation on this, let me uh, 
stop a second and see if there's any questions. Oh, actually, while I'm waiting to see if there are, I suppose I could show you, I should show you uh, some of the outcomes here. Um, let's go back and some of the graphical outcomes. Okay, let's see. First, come on. Uh, most of this is not terribly interesting if we go through the... Um, the history plots, I don't think you're going to see anything markedly different than what we saw before. Uh, the main one that would be somewhat different here, where did Sigma go out of all of this? I guess we got to wander down a little. Yeah, well, you're probably not even much to see there. The sigma was just as well estimated before, but what is not obvious here is the um, the spread would be smaller. Uh, let's see, same deal here. Let's go to where did sigma go? Over here, this is probably narrower than what was present for the other case. And so most of these are going to look very similar. If we look at the individual predictions here and you look at them for the other case, you're not going to see a whole lot of, excuse me, a whole lot of difference there. So I'm just going to kind of skim through um, these pretty quickly for these again. Are, these are, excuse me, the mean LDL percent change from baseline. We've also got, once I get there, we've also, let me scoot right on through here. We've also, okay, where'd they go? Oh, duh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. That doesn't help any. I opened up the wrong, uh, here we go. Where's the SD, guys? There it is. Sorry, I opened up the wrong one. Here we go. Actually, let's jump right down to where the uh, posterior predictions are. Okay, so again, these are... The one I was looking at is actually the one we'd be comparing with, but again, these don't look much different than those when we just look at the sample means. I'll just kind of scoot right on through those. Population predictions, and we should hit. Okay, so we can also do posterior predictions for uh, for our sample variance, or in this case, I put it in terms of the sample standard deviation in here now keep in mind again we did not incorporate any intertrial variation in here so what what you would expect to see is these are going to be pretty close uh to each other now this is looking at the overall standard deviation so it's not just the pure residual so we're looking at the also the influence of that intertrial variation on on e0 and as a, that will that results in a little bit of heterogeneity as you look through these, but not very much. You can see most of them are pretty well centered down the middle. And in particular, they don't pick up any of the trial specific variation that goes across here to any, at least not to any substantial degree. Uh, but but this is what your model. So this is now our model estimates of those. And again, remind you in these pictures, the the black is the observed. Uh, standard sample standard deviation the red is the posterior median and the bands are 95 percent prediction intervals uh, and you can sort of run through and you see much a similar pattern as we go through these things you can see some actually some pretty substantial misses on here for whatever reason uh, some of the Resuvus statin trials here, and I suspect uh, some of these are probably from the same trial. We had at least one trial where the uh, sample standard deviations were actually pretty low, and they're not being picked up very well by the model at all.
Yeah, I'll just kind of scoot through that. I don't think there's too much more of a story on those now. Okay. So that's our that's running it where we're we're modeling, we're incorporating that into the model. About the only thing we've done is improved our estimate of the uh, of that residual standard deviation. So let's go ahead and take it another step and put some inter-individual variation in the uh, we go here and get out of the solutions sample stand. Sorry, put some inter-individual variation in that residual variation component. There's a lot of different models we could pick for doing that. I'll show you one particular example, uh, but uh, but certainly there would be other options than the one I'm using here. So let's open up a couple of these. So this is the um, in the folder called Statin Gemcabine SD Trunk Emax 2. Okay, so this is our model. So this is now taking that the previous one we just did, the Staten Gem Cabine SD Trunk Emax, and incorporating that inter individual variability in here. Uh, the approach I took, let me widen this a little. Um, let's scoot down to, let's see, do I want to, well, no, let's stay up here first. Okay. So what I've done is to deal with the inter-individual variability, the approach I used is to model the log of the residual standard deviation as log normal uh, in this instance. So that's, you can see that in this line right here. So we've got the log of the standard deviation of our PCLDL, our percent change in LDL, is normal with some mean and a precision associated with that. Uh, and from that, from that log uh, of that standard deviation, I can go ahead and generate the standard deviation itself. And so this is just taking the exponential then of that log to get my standard deviation. So there's our inter-individual variation model here. Again, it's log normal for uh, for that standard deviation. You can see again, as we've done before, for a random effect, we've incorporated that in a separate loop that's looping over the trials. Uh, the uh, our likelihood right here that that equation is identical to what we saw before. Uh, and then down here where we calculate those two parameters, the a var and the b var, uh, it looks a little bit different because of the way I've parameterized the, uh, our residual variation. Now I've parameterized it in terms of the standard deviation rather than in terms of the precision. So you can see pretty much directly I've got n minus 1 divided by 2 times you know, our sigma squared here, this SD PCLDL is equivalent to the sigma in the equation on the slides. So that takes care of that. Uh, in addition, I rewrote the uh, the equation here for our PCLDL precision term that's used in the likelihood for the mean. I rewrote that also in terms of those standard deviations rather than a precision value. So that's the core difference in the model. Of course, we still have to provide some priors for these components. So we've got our two components here, the log of uh, our standard deviation and or for, well, I've got the, a mean for that and a precision associated with that. So I've got to come up with some priors for those. And that's what's going on in this section down here. Uh, and the approach I used in this is for that, for the log of the standard deviation, uh, for its mean, I ended up using just a fairly flat normal in there. And then for the precision, I used a gamma, uh, 0 0.01, 0 0.01 here. 
Uh, again, there'd be a lot of reasonable choices you could make here. For example, uh, other reasonable choices might actually be to put, uh, yeah, you, you could reasonably stick uh, uniforms. You, you could put, you could work, say, directly with the standard deviation rather than the log, and you could do something like uniforms on both of them, uh, where the upper bo lower bound is zero and upper bound is, you know, reasonably high relative to the values you anticipate, assuming you want it to be weakly informative. And I think that is all of the, well, almost all of the differences. That's the, the differences needed to implement the fitting uh, for the, for getting posterior predictions. There now is a difference between the individual and population predictions, or what I term here, sort of the conditional and unconditional uh, predictions here. So for our individual prediction here, uh, I basically rewrite the, let me scroll up here, I basically rewrite the original likelihood function again and just change the name on what's on the left-hand side. And then to do the prediction, uh, it's similar, but I also have to recalculate the, the BVAR parameter in terms of a in terms of an unconditional prediction uh, for our for our standard deviation and that unconditional prediction for that value has to be taken care of also up here in the other loop where I generate that separately from the one which is conditioned on each individual's uh, each individual's uh, data individual in this case meaning individual trial so that's the, another difference in there to do our posterior predictions changes a bit uh, and then in the corresponding r script um you know of course we got to change the name up here uh let's see what changes uh, we have, let's see, the data is the same as the last. There wouldn't be anything that changes there. Uh, but in the initial estimates, we have to provide initial estimates corresponding to the new parameters we introduced uh, in the uh, in this model here. Actually, we, we in a sense, we got rid of one because we replaced it with, you can think of that previous uh, precision uh, initial estimate that we did is being replaced by this one uh, but then we also have to provide an initial we also have to provide initial estimates for the precision related to the inter-individual variability in that uh, and along with that you know maybe change some things in the uh, up here to specify the new quantities that we'd probably like to monitor uh, and in particular we're also going to be interested in monitoring uh some more information well let's see is that actually that's pretty much the same well almost we've got the uh our our variance predict our predicted variance in here but i'm also collecting our into study specific uh random effect here for that standard deviation so that's most of the changes that occurred there uh so let's go ahead and see what happened with that Let's, again, we'll go ahead and do the Julia Child method. Okay, I'll scoot right through those. Those are old no, old news for the most part. Um, is there anything I want to say here? Uh, where'd our sigma go here? Oh, okay, I guess this is sort of the equivalent of the sigma over here. That actually, I believe, is, it's, I don't know, might be slightly tighter. I won't bet on that. We can take a look. It's probably better to see it in the table. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Uh, these are predicted means. Again, those aren't going to look much different, so I'm not going to spend any time on those. You scoot down. Okay, here we go. Now, unlike before, there are, is a difference again between the individual and the uh, and the population predictions for uh, for our 
observed standard deviation. So here's some posterior predictions overlaid on the data here. Now recall that what we saw before is almost all of the predictions were kind of centered in the same place and the bounds were relatively wide. Here what you see now is for each individual prediction, it comes substantially closer to the observed value and the and the bounds, you know, and the uh, prediction intervals are, are narrower uh, than what we saw before, uh, which is not surprising because we, again, we've allowed for the possibility that things are different from each other and you no longer have to sort of subsume that in the overall posterior for that. Some of that's handled by the inter-trial variation component. And if we sort of, if we just sort of scope right through here, you'll see that same pattern uh, pretty much all the way through here. Um, you know, generally we come much closer to capturing things, of course, at the potential risk of overfitting. Uh, and then we do the population predictions and let me go to the standard deviations again. And here you get something that looks more like what we saw before when we didn't incorporate the intertrial variation since now the populations are predicting more or less the same value uh, for each trial. Okay, we'll just kind of scoot through there. Uh, let's take a look at some information here that we might also want to consider if we were trying to decide have we really improved our model or are we just overfitting uh, let's take a look at some things we might want to look at to think about that let's start with the table summary table for our parameters okay so this is for the one with intertrial variation did i close the other one yeah i guess i did let me grab, grab it this way. Open recent. Okay, so let's take a look at some information. By the way, if you look at both of these, we use the truncated Emacs in both cases. And for the most part, the effective ends are fairly reasonable. There's maybe some parameters they could be better. You know, you can see some of these are in the 200s, it might be nice to do a few more samples and get those closer to a thousand or so. Okay, so let's start with taking a look at uh, things like our deviance. Now, now we are dealing with the same data, so our dependent variables are identical. Uh, in this case, it is appropriate to look at things like the uh, the mean deviance and compare them. Okay, so for example, we look over here. This is for the model without intertrial variation in uh, in the residual variability. Uh, we've got a uh, we've got a mean deviance of about two thousand four hundred forty. Uh, and if we look over here, we've now got one that's a little bigger than two thousand fifty. Uh, so it's dropped quite a bit, um, and that's quite a large drop in here so i guess the only question is okay it's uh we've improved that but is you know is this just overfitting uh does the additional complexity in the model justify it uh and one approach for for trying to address that question is to use something use an information criteria like the deviance information criteria which penalizes this for model complexity. Uh, loosely speaking, it penalizes it for the number of, I guess you could sort of call it the number of virtual parameters. Uh, that I don't capture in here, but one way you can get to that, uh, well, there's a couple ways you can get to a DIC estimate. One is sometimes WinBugs is able to estimate it directly, and if so, that number would be uh, reported in would be reported in the log file that WinBugs produces. I actually didn't keep those log files, so we can't do that, but there is another way. Uh, and in case you've never actually used it, it's actually an, something that's contained in the bugs fit object. So I thought it might be worth showing you how to get to that. Let's, uh, let me actually show you that. 
So which one have I got? Okay, so this is the uh, the model with. Um, where are we going here? Okay, so yeah, this is the model with uh, inter-individual, sorry, inter-trial variation in our residual variation component. Let me go ahead and run everything here except for the except for bugs itself because we didn't necessarily want to wait around for that. Okay. Oh, you know what? I don't think I opened up. An, yeah, I didn't open up an R job in here yet. Okay. Actually, let's open up our R window here. Uh, let's move that to another window. Come on. Okay. Make that a little bigger, too. Okay, and then the trick here is I'm not going to run bugs fit, but remember I mentioned that if you do this line right here minus the uh, uh, the comment components here, if we run that, which I'll do right now, uh, that allows us to pull in the bugs fit object that was saved from a previous run. So assuming everything went well, so we've got bugs fit. If you look at the elements that are inside bugs fit. Okay, here's the names of the various components there. Uh, and in particular, you'll notice there's uh, if you and unless you've set this so that it so that it does not calculate DIC, uh, there will there will be an item here called DIC, and again, if you now I get, that object might be there all the time. I don't remember. I think it is, but it'll be null if you told it not to calculate it. So assuming you didn't tell it that, that object is there, and if we look at that, okay. So there's our DIC deviance information criteria estimate for the for our model with um, model with inter-individual variation in the residual variability so here we go it's about 2129 there so remember that and let's pull up the other model so do, 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 do. okay we're going to do the same deal here Okay, and pull up its bugs fit. Okay, and let's run that same thing here for the new one. And we've got 2492. So we've got, what was it I say, 2129 versus 2492. The smaller, the better. I'd say the 2129 wins, so that would be that would indicate that uh, if I was making a model selection decision based upon that information alone, uh, I would certainly select the model that does have inter-individual variation uh, in uh, in the residual variability. So, so that gives you some idea of how how you might attack that particular issue for this case. Uh, but again, in neither case did it markedly change the uh, the predictions for our sample means, or for, in particular, or our predictions for our population means, for that matter. Uh, and as a result, it's you know it, for that's where I come back to the previous comments here that if you're going to use this for say comparing, if you're only going to be trying to compare population means. Yeah, it falls under the heading of it doesn't hurt, but it's probably not going to markedly improve uh, your estimation. Okay, let's see. That's probably, again, a good point to stop, see if there's any questions, because I think we're going to wander off to another topic in a minute here.
Okay, nothing popping up yet here, so let me uh, keep my eye open for anything if it shows up. But in the meantime, let me make an assignment for for our next lab session. Again, this should be re if you download the new uh, uh, the new handout, this should be reflected in that. Okay, so I just called this hands-on problem 3B because it's going to build on, excuse me, what you did in the hands-on problem 3. So in that one, you had worked with, uh, with the statin, you know, where you were looking at the two statins, uh, torvastatin, resuvastatin, and analyzing some uh, sample mean data. Uh, I'd like you to take that, take the, the model that you did there, and incorporate standard deviations uh, as part of the modeling. And I propose that you do that in three different ways. <laughs> so the first way is, uh, is one like I, is, like I showed you last week, uh, where you just directly use the observed standard error in the likelihood for the sample mean. So that's the approach. Uh, Recall I did this example here, the Stanton Gem Cabine Trunk Emax 2. Uh, that's where I did it that way rather than estimating the residual variance. So that'd be the first case. The second and third cases correspond to the two cases we went over today. So the first, the one there is going to be to model the sample mean and standard deviation data, assuming the same residual standard deviation for all of the trials like we did in the, uh, the first example for today, Stanton Jim Cabine SD Trunk Emax. And then the third case is where, again, you're going to model the sample mean and standard deviation data, but now you allow for intertrial variation in the residual standard deviation. Uh, again, and that's like the, the last example I did. Let's go ahead and do those. Uh, compare the results of the three models uh, in terms of you know quality of estimates. Uh, something we didn't really do much head to head, but it might be worth taking some time to look at would be to compare sort of on a head to head basis. What do the posterior predictions look like uh, for these cases? Um, and then I sort of posed a a question that I, I've touched on so far today already in terms of the cases I did here, but I'm asking the question, is it appropriate to compare the model one results, one being the one in this list of three, with those for models two and three using DIC or mean deviance? And then the question is why or why not? So that's, uh, that's your exercise that uh, we'll go over this coming Monday. And then any questions on, on that? Okay, nothing cropping up here, so I'll go ahead and move on. Uh, I, what I thought I'd do today is take a look at um, a recent example that we had worked on uh, with some uh, colleagues at uh, Beringer Ingelheim, uh, where uh, where we ended up doing some model-based meta-analysis com comparing a couple of uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, namely citagliptin and linagliptin. Uh, using model-based meta-analysis, and the, you know, the the driver for this, it, I think, the which isn't necessarily clearly stated in the paper, is the idea that um, the the sponsor wanted to have a a means of 
of quantitatively comparing these two compounds in the absence of actually having a direct head-to-head -head study and being able to use that information uh, in in various situations where they're typically negotiating with, you know, either uh, government or other third-party payers, uh, where they're negotiating, uh, you know, with payers and with uh, other other types of uh, organizations that might be setting uh, either setting prices or determining which agents, you know, which drugs would be in their formularies. And so the, this was to be a tool to support uh, that sort of marketing and pricing issues uh, for them. So from so in this case, it was not being used to make key decisions during drug development. Instead, it was being used uh, for trying to support others' decision making uh, and marketing uh, by comparing agents. And again, doing this in a case where they didn't have what would usually be seen as probably the gold standard here, namely a you know a nice blinded controlled trial directly comparing the two agents head to head. So I was going to illustrate uh, this example. To some degree, I'm probably running a little ahead of ourselves because it, it does involve analysis of longitudinal data, which is something we will get on to probably not next week, but the week after, I think. So let's go ahead and jump to that. Let's see, did I open that up already? I don't think so. No. Let me, or did I thought I did. Where'd it go? Oh, no, I closed it. Okay, let's go get it. So, oh, and they forget. So here on, on this slide, there's a link to it. In addition, uh, I guess I should point out, I've also provided a link on the course website. If you look right here where it says new publication, MBMA for comparing DPP4 inhibitor efficacy. If you click on that, in fact, I'll show you because it actually makes you go through two steps. I was trying to make it do it directly, but hadn't figured out how to do that. Uh, no, it did do it directly. I'll take that back. Okay, so you can. So here it gives you the the HTML version, and from that you can go ahead and grab. If you click on it, you can get like the PDF version or what have you. Okay, but we're not. I'm not going to use that. Uh, I'm going to do it directly on a copy I've got here. Let me go ahead and open that up. Okay, did it keep my highlights? Yes, it did. Good. Okay. So this is what we're looking at. Uh, so let's see, where do I want to jump to? So I kind of gave you the basic premise. We're going to be looking at citagliptin and linagliptin. Uh, here, sinagliptin being viewed in this com in this example is it's kind of being viewed as the standard of care. Or at least it's the key comparator in this example. Uh, it goes through a dis you know there's a little discussion around that. Gee, it really would have been good if we had to head com head comparison, but we don't. Uh, so we'd like to do indirect comparisons using. Uh, available public source data uh, that's out there, but then that gets complicated by things like, uh, you know, using somewhat different populations in terms of entry criteria. Uh, there's also differences such as trial duration that come into play uh, with a lot of these trials in, uh, in diabetics. There are run-in periods during which either a certain either a concomitant medication is washed in or concomitant meds are washed out and again that complicates things particularly because the endpoint we're going to look at here is uh, glycated hemoglobin or HbA1c and HbA1c takes a fair amount of time to change we're talking something on the order of weeks to months for it to come to a steady state and the typical run-in periods are not long enough for that to really reach steady state. So we're going to try and adjust for things like that uh, as part of this. Um, you know, and so 
So the, a lot of these things are driving the use of using model-based meta-analysis. And there's, and to some degree, this paper argues that some of the other methods for indirect comparisons, such as so-called network meta-analysis, are not ideal because of some of those complications. Okay, is there more I want to say? Actually, let me maybe make this slightly bigger for you. Uh, I think that's mostly what was being stated here. Let's see. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, and in particular, they make the comment here that in particular endpoint-based approaches can't be sensibly applied when the studies involved in the review vary substantially with respect to treatment duration. Uh, and I'd probably qualify that further that not only do they vary in duration, but the the endpoint they're looking at is also continuing to vary over time. And so duration is an important determinant in what you might see. So it needs to be accounted for in some manner. Uh, and then this is sort of some of the same story. So what is it saying here? Yeah, by modeling the response as a function of time, model-based meta-analysis allows integrating information from trials of different durations different sampling time points and uh, and enables the use of less restrictive inclusion exclusion criteria for study selection and more efficient use of the data from the studies and so on basically arguing that we can incorporate a, a, a more heterogeneous collection of studies and still get valid comparisons Let's see, is this something I really want to say much about? Let's see. Not really here. Okay, and then the stated objective here then is to use model-based meta-analysis to develop a longitudinal statistic model, statistical model for comparing the efficacy of linagliptin and citagliptin uh, and efficacy as measured by changes in HbA1c levels in patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, yeah, yeah, same story. Uh, it goes through a fair discussion of the the study search and selection process, uh, the criteria for the studies. So, for example, it's stating that the studies were double-blind, randomized, control trials that were at least 12 weeks duration. Uh, that looked at either citagliptin or linagliptin with respect to uh, changes in HbA1c levels. Uh, of course, the patients had to be type 2 diabetic patients, uh, put a criteria on the HbA1c, uh, that the baseline HbA1c had to be greater than 7% 7, 7 at baseline. Actually, I want to say baseline, now that I said that, I don't remember whether that was at baseline or screening, probably at screening. And okay, now it does spend a little time that I didn't, uh, re that I'm not going to go through right now, because that's something we'll talk about more. Uh, when I get to a discussion about dealing with longitudinal data, uh, but it does cite uh, some publications uh, that um, both uh, our group as well as some folks in Pfizer have done on how to deal with longitudinal data, and in particular, how to deal with adjusting for within-arm correlations when you've got longitudinal data uh, within treatment arms. Uh, so this does spend some time on that. Well, I won't go through that now because we're going to go through that in some detail in a couple of weeks. But it does make reference to that. Um, mentions uh, some key assumptions here. Uh, where are we going here? Yeah, okay. So it made some assumptions about how, you know, about how things like prior treatment and washout from prior treatment would affect uh, it would affect HbA1c. So, in particular, it mentions that given the uh, the known properties of measured HbA1c, it was assumed that the absence of additional interventions, or in the absence of additional interventions, HbA1c for patients washing out of prior anti-diabetic medication 
during some study washout or run-in phase that you would see a rise in the HbA1c levels. Uh, well, it says until reaching a plateau. Well, it assumes that if you if the run-in was long enough, it would. It actually didn't assume it reached a plateau at run-in, uh, and that the incremental effect of DPP4 on inhibitors on eight. Let's see. Sorry, let me read this. I'm forgetting what it said. Oh yeah, it basically means that one that when you do administer DPP4, uh, an active DPP4 inhibitor, that the expectation is that the HbA1c would would increase gradually and would approach a, a plateau, plateau. So the idea is that both a you know both onset and offset of drug effects would you know would have sort of an asymptotic property is basically what those two assumptions are saying. Uh, the tool used here is like we've been looking at its bugs. In this particular case, it was open bugs rather than win bugs, but more or less the same story uh, as what you're working with right now. Uh, though it was one again where the uh, bugs in this case was again used largely for the models for the it's, flexibility in specifying the models uh, for the most part it used uh, very weakly informative priors so the uh, the Bayesian aspect of it wasn't that critical uh, and I'll leave you to some of the others this oh I pull up this slide or this figure because this illustrates sort of the the some of the core elements of the underlying model structure uh, so there's two plots here. The upper plot illustrates what you what the model would say about a case where uh, where you had somebody uh, on prior medication of some sort, and that there was a run-in period during which they were washed out of that medication. So so this up to that point, you know, I'm looking at the blue curve here. Uh, you would expect things to have reached steady state of some sort. You know, if they were constantly on some study medication, the, or not study, but some other antidiabetic medication, they're taken off of it. So you would expect that you would lose that effect, and that would appear as a gradually rising HbA1c up until the time that the actual zero day of the, you know, that the uh, randomization begins and the patients are started either started on a new treatment or you know or or assigned to placebo and if they're assigned to placebo you would expect to see this rise continue up to some asymptote if they were if they were given an active dpp4 you would expect to see that the hba1c would begin to fall off again it falls off gradually towards some asymptote over time so those are the sort of time courses one would expect to see. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, the patient was either not on any prior antidiabetic medication or was simply left on them as background medication, what you would expect to see is things would stay fairly flat uh, through the run-in period. And when they went off the run-in, when they... Uh, when randomization, they're randomized to treatment. If they were assigned to placebo, you would expect to see things fairly flat. I believe the uh, the the model itself had a small uh, placebo effect component in here. Thus, you see this little rise uh, that's reflected here, uh, but it's essentially flat. But if they were assigned to, to an active DPP4 inhibitor, you would expect us again to see it fall off asymptotically. So those are the kinds of patterns that the model attempts to capture. So it explicitly models both the offset during run-in and the onset during uh, assigned treatment. Uh, and if you're curious about the specifics of the model, that's actually in, a, um, uh, in an appendix, which is also available from the site. Let's see, that's this guy here. Uh, the model details are shown uh, in here. Let me scroll down to uh, the basic components here. Uh, 
it basically breaks down the model for HbA1c in terms of basically a baseline component uh, plus a washout effect in the case. Uh, maybe I'll just do this. There we go. Yeah. Uh, a washout effect in the case where the patient was on some prior medication. There's a small placebo effect component here. Uh, and then finally, a drug effect, which is a mix of a dose response model. It's just a simple Emax model in here where the Emax would vary for the two drugs. Actually, I need to double check. I don't remember if they ended up with the same or different Emaxes for, uh, for the two compounds off the top of my head. Uh, and then there's this uh, asymptotic component that describes the uh, basically the wash in of the drug effect. Uh, so that's the broad structure in here. And then there was a, you know, a, there was a stochastic component in here describing residual variation, intertrial variation. And then, uh, as we'll talk about when we get into uh, and get into looking at longitudinal data, there's also an additional interarm variation component uh, as part of this to account for sort of within arm correlation. Uh, let's see, did I want to hit on any of the other specifics here? Probably not. They go into more detail about some of the components and justifications around them. Um, no, there were a couple of hopefully reasonably clever attempts at trying to uh, constrain some of the parameters so that they had appropriate properties. Uh, it does talk a bit about some of the covariates in here. In particular, there were um, uh, there were some ethnic differences. Um, I believe there were some measure of body size brought into it. And they talk about the priors. We won't go into that. Yeah, let's scoot on down. Uh, well, these are just baseline um, baseline data. Unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to publish the uh, uh, the rest of the data, which might have been nice. Okay, so let's look at what some of the results look like. Just sort of blow this up. These are posterior predictive checks uh, in a couple expressed a couple of different ways. So each panel here is a separate study. Uh, now I got to remember which is which here because one of these is citagliptin, one is doo -doo 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 -doo. Come on, where is... oh there it is on top. Okay so the red is linagliptin, the blue is citagliptin, and gray is placebo. Sorry let me get this adjusted to a reasonable size. Okay so and these are would be what I've been referring to as either uh, population predictions or unconditional predictions as opposed to individual predictions here. Uh, and so you get some idea how well the model is able to describe uh, the different cases here. So you can get a general sense. The, uh, of course, the observed data are the symbols here and the predictions. And these, I believe, are 90% credible intervals for our predictions here. So it's generally doing fairly well. These, by the way, are HbA1c changes from baseline expressed as a function of time. So you can see the various time courses in here. And if we scoot over to the right, these are now expressing these as difference from placebo in here. So you can see these even look actually a bit tighter than the when you just look at the difference from baseline. So again, it does a pretty good job of capturing uh, the data from the various studies. Uh, this is just, you, you've seen these, of course, and this is just a Another way of looking at pretty much the same thing. They don't tell a much different story, so I won't spend any time on these. And this is really the story they wanted to tell, is now taking the model and using it for inferences about comparing uh, citagliptin to linagliptin. And in particular on this, they're comparing the um, 
the maximum labeled doses for the two compounds. So it's five milligrams for linagliptin and 100 for citagliptin. Uh, those are daily doses, I believe. And so here we're looking at HbA1c difference from placebo versus time. Uh, and this is, uh, and uh, sorry, this is uh, the population they simulated here was what they considered sort of a, it was kind of an average population uh, when they looked at the various trials. So that's sort of a typical mix of males, females, and racial combinations based upon the trials that were done. Uh, now, what's not shown here is during when we did this work, we also did explicitly did comparisons for some of the subgroups looking at, you know, groups of broken out by ethnic, you know, by ethnicity and gender, uh, body weight and so on to explore how the compounds compare for the different cases. But this is kind of the overall comparison for a group of what they sort of labeled as a typical population. Uh, and so the gray here is the 90% credible interval for citagliptin. The hatches here are the hatched areas are is for linagliptin. So you can see they're basically, they're almost fully overlapping on each other uh, in this instance. So there's very little difference in those predictions. Uh, the, trying to remember what the dots are on this. Sorry, I need to check something. What's going bing here? Whatever that is, that can wait. Um, I think, what was that? Let's see, I forget what the dash line was supposed to be for. Uh, so made drug ads for reference population, no free treatment. I don't know what the dash line, I guess I'd have to read the text more carefully. I don't remember why they put that reference line across there. Suppose it probably represented some, what they considered to be some minimally beneficial effect or something. It seems to correspond to minus a half percent difference there. Uh, so you can see that uh, this is where, if for patients where there's no washout, uh, the other curve is for patients where they were there was a six week washout from prior treatment just to show that that didn't really make any substantive difference in the comparative uh, efficacy for the two compounds. And then the uh, this histogram on the right is now looking at the difference in effect between linagliptin and, and sinagliptin, citagliptin here. So so is that the direction? Yeah, so it's got to be linagliptin minus citagliptin here. You can see it's pretty cleanly centered here about zero. Uh, yeah, and, and the range is not too bad here. Uh, it's a fairly reasonably narrow band here. So again, it's making the argument that given this body of evidence, the, uh, there doesn't appear to be any substantive differences in the efficacy of the two compounds with respect to changing HbA1c. And I think, yeah, that's probably about all the story I wanted to tell about this. Uh, again, I guess I'll take a breather, see if there's any, any questions, maybe while I'm waiting for that. And what I will mention is this actually was a, this was kind of a specific issue to go, you know, this was done to cover a specific issue to compare the two compounds. This was actually a subset of a larger piece of work that was done to look at a broader range of DPP-4 inhibitors. Um, but this was, this is the one they really wanted to focus on. And it, it was in some ways easier to make it rigorous by only comparing the two of them. Uh, some of the other Glyptons, the the nature, the trials were the, well. There was more heterogeneity in the trial type, so it though I think it it made a reasonable story. It was maybe a less clean story uh, to take to third party payers and um, you know and formulary committees.
I guess this remains a pretty quiet group here. Um, let's see. This is this actually took less time to get this far than I anticipated. Let's see what we're going to be getting into next. Oh, something popped up. What do we got? Okay, it says comment on study by Bergenstahl under predicting the observed but also not having a placebo grip. Let's take a look. I uh, don't know that I I have a comment on it in particular because I did the earlier work on this, but not the uh, not the later work where we finally dug into this. So I don't have much to say other than I guess the the comment that's probably more critical here is the lack of a placebo group uh, as part of this. Uh, because you don't have a placebo group that I would expect that that data is likely to be less influential on the overall inferences here. Uh, be simply because you don't have any, any sort of common treatment to tie it back to, to compare with linagliptin in there. So it, it contributes some things, but it, it's a trial that would contribute pretty weakly to the comparison. Uh, in particular, it would contribute weakly to the comparison with placebo and, and consequently it would contribute weakly to the comparison between citagliptin and, uh, and linagliptin. Uh, but why in particular, I don't know enough about that particular study to say, uh, whether there's anything there that might explain that particular, uh, you know, that particularly strong outcome they saw with, um, I'm forgetting which one's which, with citagliptin for that study. Okay, let me see what we're uh, we're planning for next. As I say, I th thought this would be about as far as we would get, because uh, where we're going to be going next is to talk about how to uh, about application of these models for simulations. Uh, and in particular, as you see here, what I'm going to be talking about is what I'm terming population simulations. And I'm trying to use a term here to distinguish it from, uh, from clinical trial simulations. Uh, and maybe I'll go ahead and maybe just mention the first, what have I got in the first couple slides here? Yeah, let me just talk and just mention this. We'll probably just close out with just... Uh, the first slide on this, and uh, so that, and we'll hit on this next Wednesday. But just to help get you to think in terms of this type of simulation versus clinical trial, because I often find there seems to be a significant confusion uh, between the two notions. So, in fact, even before I talk about the population simulations, let's talk a little bit about trial simulations. Now, typically when we're doing trial simulations, the idea is we want, you know, we want to simulate the results or the probable range of results you would expect to see when you administer, uh, you know, you administer a treatment uh, to a, you know, a finite population um, and, 
you know, where you're trying to simulate. So one of the important characteristics is the population is some finite sample size that you are, in fact, one of the questions that you may be trying to address is what that sample size ought to be. Uh, so you're looking at, you know, a, a limited sample size. You may also be looking at simulate simulating uh, other characteristics of a trial that influence the outcome, things like dropout behavior, non-adherence, things like that as a component of the problem. You're not, you're, you're not necessarily trying to say what would happen on average to a population of, you know, of, you know, of particularly large size. You're trying to ask what's going to happen to that in that study design with that sample size and that set of events. Uh, whereas population simulations, I'm usually thinking of trying to simulate what would happen if, you know, if this treatment were given to sort of a conceptually infinite, you know, a hypothetically infinite population uh, instead. So I'm not asking what happens if I get, get what results I'll see in a trial. I want to say what happens in a population. Now, of course, there's uh, there's some uncertainty in that because my model is, you know, consists of, you know, besides the uncertainty in the model itself, there's also uncertainty in the values of the model parameters. So I'm going, when I do a simulation to get, like, to predict that population quantity, I'm going to get some uncertainty about that that's driven entirely by the uncertainty in the model. Whereas when I do it for a trial, it's also influenced by the finite sample size. So I also have sampling variability as part of that. So formally, the way I've tried to define it is, is what you see here, where I'd say I'm going to use the term population simulation to refer to simulation of a population estimand. And that population estimand would be a quantity like a population mean, a population percentile, or the probability of an event in here. And it's and I'm trying to estimate that in this hypothetically infinite size population of people. And again, that's in contrast to simulating a clinical trial or to simulating individual observations. Because what I want to know is not what does an individual look like? I don't even I don't even usually want to know about what does the probable range of individual outcomes look like? Occasionally, that will be of interest. I'm usually going to ask questions like, what does the population mean look like, for example? Uh, so again, I'm not looking for what's the probable range of individual outcomes. I want to know what the population mean would be, and I want to compare the population mean for one treatment versus another treatment. So that's where my focus is going to be. Uh, as I say, the idea is going to be use simulations to characterize the probable range, like a 90 or 95 percent credible interval, for the population estimate of each treatment of interest. So that's going to be the focus we're going to have when we discuss population simulations. And then we'll talk about that uh, in, in how we deal with that uh, in some different contexts. And we'll also talk about some related types of simulations of this to try and help you understand the distinctions between uh, different elements. So if you're interested in reading forward for, um, I guess, for next week, uh, you know, you can go through the slides here on simulations. So that starts here, what, at 178. Um, touch on, we'll hit some examples here. Uh, and then I start talking about uh, dealing with some other types, some simulations that were, were, what if you want to do some of these population simulations when you actually do have a model that was originally constructed based on individual data where you've got all the uh, inter-individual variation represented and so on. And we'll talk about some different simulation algorithms here and which ones are probably most relevant or most equivalent to the types of population simulations we're talking about. So we'll go through that. Uh, let's see, how far will it go here? 
Okay, so it was, what did I say, 182? So basically 182 to 194 uh, will certainly cover, uh, and there will be one or two examples that we'll hit on. And I'll probably look over this material. Uh, don't be surprised if I add some material to this uh, before we actually uh, before we actually dig into it next week. Okay, I think that's as far as I'm going to take it. Any uh, any last comments or questions? Okay, looks like nothing's popping up here, so I guess I'll go ahead and vanish and uh, look forward to uh, talking to you again on Monday. Bye for now.